brings us to Zafar Bengash, who I don't think believes it. Are you there, Zafar? <laughs> yes, hello, Phil. How are you? <laughs> Very good. I'm sorry I got uh, sort of tied up. Uh, oh, that's okay. You gave us a chance to pontificate. Uh, that's good. And uh, we had just come to the really vital point here, which is uh, we were talking about the uh, who the who is this group of people who are telling the Syrian government that they now have to, uh, the president has to step down. They even have a little ABC. You will step down. You will share power with the opposition, and you will do this in two weeks. That's a very good question. I mean, can you <laughs> who imagine are, that? Whoa, uh, who is that? These, these people that call themselves the Arab League, and um, this is this is a, a bunch of uh, yo-yos that have absolutely no... Uh, that's more uh, like it, science, <laughs> political science. <laughs> I took that course. <laughs> no, no authority, no representation, even in their own countries. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, for some reason, they think that um, they have the authority uh, to tell the Syrian government what to do uh, and what not to do. Uh, you know, the, I was really struck by um, a you know announcement that was made that the. Uh, the uh, the group of uh, Arab parliamentarians mm -hmm. uh, that are uh, affiliated with the Arab League, they have also demanded of the Syrian government to uh, adhere to their demands, otherwise uh, there would be terrible consequences. And I was thinking, uh, you know, which um, uh, which country in, in, in the Middle East um, has had elections to have parliamentarians who are making these demands of the Syrian government. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't hear of any, any elections being held anywhere. Only now, in recent weeks, we have had, uh, you know, a few countries go through elections. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, they are all dictatorships, and yet they talk about uh, Arab parliamentarians. And these yes. have, uh, this is a group that has existed for quite a few years. So yes. we've uh, well, you know, and, and we're speaking to Zafar Bengais, crescent-online.net. He's speaking, by the way, Wednesday night at McMaster. Thursday night. Thursday night. Okay. I'm sorry. Thursday night. Boy, I'm, glad we, I'm glad we have you on the air. Thursday night um, at uh, McMaster. And do we have the room number? Yes, the uh, Ewart Angus uh, Center, room 1A6, 7.30 p.m. Great. Now, Zafar, th this point about, you know, they, they're – Monarchs and they're saying to him, "Look, you got to step down. You got to do it in two weeks, and you got to share power with this unknown group that has guns from somewhere else." Uh, I'm wondering about. He seems, uh, in his response to them, very formal and uh, very, very correct, and he and he's sort of trying to get along with them, saying, "Well, look, I'm doing this. I'm doing that." But wouldn't it? I think wouldn't the world be better served if he simply said, uh, "Nice to hear from you. By the way, I'd be happy to chip." share power when you do it. <laughs> I, mean, I think he should have said that. I'm, I think we should send a message to him to say that, you know, you can make an offer yeah. to these guys. As soon as you have a parliament, <laughs> uh, Your Highness, uh, and, uh, and you have a premier and you share power with the premier, then I'll do that. And I'm not, I'm not, as a matter of fact, you're the leader, so I'll follow. I'll you follow do it you. first. Absolutely. I think that's that's a wonderful suggestion. I think we better send it out to well, them. Let's do that. Yes. There there are people, by the way, who say that about the Assad government that they tend to, they're play, in a way they're playing along too much. It's almost like they understand they're in a kind of a logical box. Right. They've agreed to certain things because they're trying to make nice. Yes. But they're doing it with people who are not making nice. These yes. people are out for their the head of Assad, and they also want to bring in somebody rather unknown to the rest of it. It's going to be the mystery guest. Yes. Now, who is the mystery guest? Who are these guys with the guns, and where did they get the guns? Exactly. They, they, you see, these, um, these people that are there with the guns, et cetera, they have um, actually, uh, most of these guns are being uh, given to them through uh, Jordan, another of those uh, roaring democracies in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, when... Uh, the father, the, the other king, King Hussein, was about to die of cancer uh, back in 1999. Uh, he rushed back to Jordan to um, displace uh, the crown prince, who was going to be his brother, uh, Prince Hassan, mm -hmm. and instead um, appointed his own son to become the king. And so uh, from Jordan... A lot of weapons are being smuggled into Syria, and these are paid for by the Saudis, uh, that other uh, mm -hmm. very 
a great democracy in the Middle East where when the yes. when one brother dies then um, the other takes over and and presidents and uh, prime ministers come and kiss their hand and say oh I'm so sorry yes <laughs> so sorry <laughs> exactly and these are the kinds he gave of, me a horse once I love yeah. that horse yeah yeah so these are the kinds of people that are uh, basically um, making demands of um, uh, the, the Syrian government uh, at the present time. Mm-hmm. And incidentally, uh, you know, there was a, a survey done by um, a, a group called the Doha Debate, which is uh, run by the BBC, uh, in that um, it is interesting that the survey found that 55% of the Syrian people wanted uh, President Bashar al-Assad to remain in power. This was a survey done by the BBC under their um, the Doha debate um, label, and uh, they also expanded this this survey to people outside Syria, not Syrians living outside, but in other Arab countries like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, etc. And they found out that 81 um, percent of the Arab people wanted Bashar al-Assad to resign. But within Syria, 55% of the Syrian people wanted him to stay as president. Mm -hmm. So when this report was published on the BBC, on their website, they simply reported that 81% of the Arabs want Bashar al-Assad to resign (laughs) without saying that 55% of the Syrians want him to stay. The people whose country it is. (laughs) So you see this bizarre situation over there. Mm-hmm. That you know, every every outsider wants to tell the other what how he should run his country or what he should do, mm-hmm. but they are just simply not prepared to consider their own internal um, situation. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, again, this is Zafar uh, Bengash, and it's uh, Crescent Hyphen Online dot net, and Zafar speaking Thursday in Hamilton at McMaster uh, University at uh, is it seven o'clock? Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Now. There, it's been suggested, uh, there's a gentleman I read, he's a very sarcastic professor at uh, 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 Lebanese, a very, very bright fellow called the Angry Arab, if people are looking for him. Uh, and he's, one of the things, he's not, he doesn't like anybody, which of course makes it difficult to, for <laughs> when one reads him to understand what he's thinking about. But he does raise a question, I wonder what your thoughts are. He says that uh, the Syrian government attacks a lot of people for for bothering them, and as well they should. I've, actually, I don't know why they don't tell people just to bu- get a, uh, leave them alone, but he says that they are shy about getting in, into a fight with, the, with Saudi Arabia. Why would that be, or is it true, and why would that be? Well, I um, don't know if this is true, but um, the way I read the situation is that uh, the Syrian government obviously um, is, uh, playing a fairly sophisticated game in the sense that uh, they don't want to open too many fronts for themselves. Uh, they want to see if they can uh, manage uh, this uh, crisis that they are facing without um, picking on fights with too many people. Um, for instance, uh, you know, they, they, the Syrians have agreed to Arab League monitors to come to their country, but they also uh, put down certain conditions, uh, which were that uh, their military bases, etc., would not be open to these monitors because they don't want uh, spies. Spy, exactly, (laughs) absolutely. Personally, that would be my first. Absolutely, that's that's correct. And and so, uh, although they are obviously not happy with the Saudis because the Saudis uh, naturally have been instigating uh, this trouble uh, in Syria for quite a while. They are the ones that are financing it. And the Saudis, of course, are working um, very closely with the Americans as well as the Israelis. And so, naturally, the Syrians are not happy about it. But um, what they want to do is to see if they can uh, resolve this crisis through discussions and negotiations. Mm-hmm. It's something that I, I, it's of interest to note that the proposals that the Syrian government has made to have a dialogue with the opposition forces, the groups that are within Syria, the political groups I'm talking about, 
they are open to holding a dialogue with the Syrian government. But the groups that are sitting outside Syria, whether in Paris or Turkey or anywhere else, they adamantly refuse to have any discussion with the government of Syria. And, and they're escalating, right? They're, exactly. they're calling for a, a, a Libya-style operation. Correct. They are basically, uh, you know, they, this whole notion of the free Syrian army is actually a cover for foreign interference in Syria. Because, I mean, true, there are some uh, members of the Syrian armed forces that have um, defected, but their number is quite insignificant. Uh, but their label is very useful for the, the foreign opposition forces because they want to use that label by saying, well, we are getting thousands of uh, Syrian uh, troops to defect from uh, the army, and they are joining us, whereas, mm -hmm. in fact, many of these people that go under the label of the Free Syrian Army are actually mercenaries from uh, places like Jordan or Lebanon or these other places that are opposed to the Syrian government uh, because the Syrian government is part of what we refer to as the resistance front that comprises the Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Palestine, and Iran, uh, this resistance front against uh, Israeli occupation of Palestine and of uh, Lebanese uh, territory. So the whole thrust of what is happening in Syria, uh, although the Syrian people definitely have legitimate grievances, I mean, definitely it would be worthwhile if they, if they were given their political rights and that they were, uh, there were more uh, freedoms uh, that they enjoyed. Uh, but the, the overall uh, thrust of the, the, the turmoil is not necessarily the rights of the Syrian people. It is basically to undermine the resistance front against Israel. Mm -hmm. That's why we find uh, the Lebanese involved, like you know Hariri and, and yes. his gang, Yes. The, the Jordanians are involved, the Saudis are involved, the Israelis and the Americans. They're yes. all working on this to try to uh, overthrow the, the government of, of Bashar al-Assad. And, and they're looking down the line at the Islamic Republic. Exactly. And, and which brings up, now I want to raise this issue of uh, the, how they're using this label Arab League as though it's unanimous. My understanding is that Algeria is not in favor of any of this stuff. That's correct. Algeria and, and, is and not. Lebanon is Lebanon not. as well as uh, Iraq, they have opposed these things. They have said that yeah, Iraq uh, is kind of an important one to mention, right? Because this is the great liberated democratic, you know, now everything is fine. If everything is fine, why doesn't anybody listen to what they're saying? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> in fact, you know, there was a very interesting episode um, in mid-December uh, when um, the American forces were uh, leaving, about to leave Iraq. There was uh, this ceremony in one of the military bases, and um, this American uh, general was talking to an Iraqi officer through an interpreter. So the general uh, suggested uh, to the Iraqi military officer, probably an Iraqi general, through the interpreter that uh, what we should do is to have uh, a ceremony over here in honor of the soldiers that have fallen, both American as well as Iraqis, in bringing uh, democracy to Iraq. And uh, so when the interpreter um, interpreted to the Iraqi officer, to the Iraqi general, that this is what the American general is saying, uh, the Iraqi general, without uh, waiting for the interpreter to interpret his words, he just turned around to the American general and said, no ceremony, get out. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think it was... It was, does, that, does that sound like gratitude to you? <laughs> 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 yeah, it illustrates. And so it is Iraq, and it is, and people need to know this. So they are using the letters AL, the Arab League says, Arab League this, Arab League that. But Iraq is a rather important member. Exactly. Uh, and Lebanon is a very important. And Algeria, these are, we all know these are big names. And sure. by the way, their populations overwhelmed the, the monarchies of the Gulf. Of course. And and yet, because of the Gulf's uh, little game of uh, creating a majority by having, they say, this this city is a country, this city is a country, exactly. this island is a country, then they, they say, and, and 
we combined, I say this about Syria, when in fact the great majority of Arabs haven't agreed it at all. That's correct, yes. You see, no. when you even look at, there are, um, uh, you know, the, the United Arab Emirates, <clears throat> they have, uh, you know, they're, they're basically, they used to be tent cities. Now they obviously have uh, concrete and glass towers that they have built. But they're still, you know, city-states. Mm -hmm. And they, they, each of them carries the label of a country. Yeah. Uh, and the same with Qatar and Bahrain and these other, you know, tiny, tiny little yeah. um, statelets that were created by the British in order to advance their own colonial uh, interests. And they are, of course, still protected by Britain and the United States. And these are the statelets that uh, are, are members uh, of uh, the Arab League, and they think that they have the right to demand that uh, Syria ought to do this or that or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, remind our listeners, this is Zafar Bengaj, crescent-online.net. He's speaking Thursday at McMaster uh, University in, in Hamilton ab about this uh, threat of war uh, with the Islamic Republic, which, is, as we speak, I guess now there's a, s a second U.S. N uh, super aircraft carrier uh, uh, has arrived in the Gulf, am I right? Yes, that is correct, yes. The, the Abra Abraham Lincoln uh, has, has been oh sent my. over there, and um, obviously the... <laughs> Tears the are running down my face. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the, the, the Americans... Um, for some reason, think that uh, they have the right to barge into that region, uh, and yet they are threatening all kinds of uh, things against Iran. Uh, they have uh, not only imposed uh, a raft of sanctions, uh, but there's also a campaign of sabotage and assassination of uh, Iranian uh, professors and nuclear scientists, etc. And... Um, they, uh, the, the other factor, of course, is that uh, this, this hysteria that is being created about war, uh, mm -hmm. if America sh should uh, launch that, uh, I personally believe that the consequences are going to be really horrendous for the whole world. Yes. Uh, by the way, this is, it won't be one of those offshore exercises. Exactly. Absolutely. You can't know where it will lead. <clears throat> exactly. It is not going to, uh, number one, uh, any attack on Iran uh, would have a major blowback because Iran has the capacity to hit back and hit back really hard. And even if, let's say, they do not uh, close the Strait of Hormuz, through which about 20% of the world's oil flows, uh, even if they don't close that, I'm absolutely convinced that Iran has complete uh, capacity to destroy Saudi oil fields, uh, the Kuwaiti oil fields, and oil fields of a number of other countries over there, because Iran has said that if we cannot export oil, we will make sure that nobody else can either. Yes. Because, you know, if you're going to strangle us, we'll make sure that we strangle you. Well, that's what the Americans said the War of 1812 was. Yeah. They said, you cannot tell us who we're going to trade with and, yeah. or tell us that we cannot trade. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, this is a case that somebody just ho should hold up the mirror. <laughs> for, Absolutely. And, and, you know, Zafar, we probably should point out, this is a time also not to have illusions. Uh, uh, Jimmy Carter yes. was the first to talk this way. Yeah. I mean, he, he made a big – you recall they said, you know, you have the Shah. The world understands what he is, and, and you must not allow him to come to your country yes. because he's a wanted man. And the U.S. brought him in, it, it just to kind of like an insult. Correct. Exactly. Uh, and, and so, you know, these, these kinds of things, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the American people, by and large, uh, have been kept in the dark about. Uh, but there's a long history of um, American and British interference in Iran. And now, of course, since the Islamic Revolution 33 years ago that the Iranians have decided that they want to pursue an independent policy, uh, whether one agrees with them or not in terms of you know what they are doing internally, but the fact of the matter is that they want to pursue an independent policy. They want to maintain their independence and their sovereignty and their integrity, and they are constantly being undermined and being threatened. And uh, 
over the issue of they might develop a nuclear weapon when, in fact, they do not have one. Exactly. And they are a signatory to international agreements. Exactly. Whereas the two countries talking to them this way, one of them has already used nuclear weapons against yes. people, and the other one, Israel, doesn't even is not a signatory to any international agreements. Exactly. And, it, and yet it possesses. I mean, we have to be stark staring mad not to discuss that first right. exactly. before we talk about anything about the You know, the Islamic it, it, Iran is on record as having said that they would like to have a nuclear-free Middle East. They have repeatedly offered that, that they yes. would like to have a nuclear-free Middle East. And the people of the region agree with them. The people of the region agree with them. You know what America says? America says, no, they're trying to undermine Israel. <laughs> I mean, yeah. wait a minute. You are saying that nuclear weapons are dangerous, and of yes. course they are. And yet, when Iran says, okay, you say that nuclear weapons are dangerous, so we are saying, let's eliminate them from the Middle East. And then America turns around and says, no, no, you are undermining Israel. Yes. So what, what it means is that as far as the U.S. is concerned, and incidentally a number of other countries, uh, Western countries, that uh, Israel can have nuclear weapons, but nobody else should have them in the region. I think that's, yes, that's the golden rule. They, that's, they, that's they, the they make the rule. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, it's been great talking. It's Afar Bengais, crescent-online.net. He's speaking Thursday at McMaster. in Hamilton at 7.30.